Well, the reason I want to continue in this series called Nearsighted is because, um, as we just talked about a moment ago, we need to draw near to God. God is the answer to the crisis and the conflict in our country and even in our own personal lives. We need to draw near to God. We've called this series Nearsighted because um, we want our vision um, to be focused on being near to God. And when we're near to God, it begins to change the way that we look at the world around us. Um, David, uh, King David was known as a man after God's own heart. Uh, he, he had a, a, a nearness to God. I want us to look at his life today, and we're going to contrast David, King David, with King Saul. Now, King Saul is the first king of Israel. He is uh, a guy that was really good looking. He was tall. He was like the kid that would be first to be, kick, uh, to be picked on the playground when um, the kids are getting ready for kickball. That's Saul. You know, he's, he's big, he's good looking, he's charming, he's all that. David, however, is the eighth son of Jesse. And in biblical times, in the 10th century B.C., uh, the order with which you were born defined a lot of who you were. So David is the little, the little, little, little brother. He's the littlest. He's the least. And God is going to choose David to take the place of Saul because God looks at the heart, not at the outward appearance. Saul is the embodiment of flesh. Saul is a, is a picture of Man's way of doing things when you, when you see his, his story. David, however, is a man after God's own heart. He's a man that draws close to God. He, he's not a perfect guy. And see, sometimes when we talk about being a person after God's own heart, people think, well, um, I guess I have to be perfect. David was not perfect. David was not perfect. David made some really bad mistakes in his, in his own, in his own uh, spiritual life. But... God is not looking for perfect hearts. God's looking for pure hearts. That's what God wants. And that's how we draw close to God. So I want to draw four, four things from 1 Samuel chapter 13. They're going to help us understand how we can be people that draw close to God and how we can be men and women after God's own heart. Now, that sounds like a big, tall order. You may be thinking, well, Ryan, you don't know what I did last night. Or maybe you don't know where I've been or what my story is. Just stick with me for a moment. God can do some great things in your life. Um, Acts 13, 22 says, After removing him, that's Saul, he raised up David as their king and testified about him. I have found David, the son of Jesse, to be a man after my own heart who will carry out all of my will. And we know more about King David than any other Bible character other than Jesus. Very interesting. We know a lot about King David. We know about David as a boy. We know him, about him as a young man. We know about him as an old man. We, we got the whole story. I mean, the Bible lays it out. And one of the reasons that Scripture gives us so much information about David is because he's known as the man after God's own heart. I don't know about you, but I, I want to know a little more about why God would say that about him in Acts chapter 13. And also in 1 Samuel chapter 13, it, it uh, refers to him accordingly. And if you look at 1 Samuel 13, 14, it says, but now you reign uh, your reign will not endure. This is to Saul. The Lord has found a man after his what? After his own heart. And the Lord has appointed him as rulers over his people because you have not done what the Lord commanded. Now, last week we talked about in James chapter 4 verse 8 that we can be as close to God as we want to be. Draw near to me and I will draw near to you, James says. Saul is a guy that gives God the stiff arm. David is someone who embraces the things and the teachings and his relationship with God. So let's look at four things today that are going to help us draw close to God and be people after God's own heart. Number one, faith over fear. 
People after God's own heart value faith over fear. And we feed faith or fear in our regular lives. Um, we we're always feeding one or another uh, based on uh, what we think about, our thoughts, based on our actions, based on uh, other things. We, we, when we feed fear, then what do we get? We get less faith. When we feed faith, we get what? We get less fear. Right, yeah. And, and it's funny because you can't feed faith and fear at the same time. And, and if you feed faith, you'll get faith. But if you feed fear, guess what you get? You get phobias, right? So, so to, to, to be a person after God's own heart, we got to feed faith and let fear starve. Uh, look, look at verses 6 and 7 from 1 Samuel 13. The men of Israel saw that they were in trouble because the troops were in a difficult situation. They hid in caves, in thickets among the rocks, and in holes and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul, however, was still at Gilgal, and all his troops were, get, were gripped with fear. So Saul is in a battle with the Philistines, and it doesn't look good. Okay, And if you, if you read the context of 1 Samuel 13, the Israelites don't have iron, they don't have swords, they don't have spears and, and normal weaponry. Okay, The Philistines have a monopoly on the market, and they don't want to share it with the Israelites because the Israelites are their enemies. Okay, You, you, you don't want to share it with the bad guys because you don't want the bad guys to use that against you. So the Israelite army, not only are they small in number, they don't have normal weapons. And in verse 22, it says that Saul is the, uh, excuse me, that Jonathan, who's the son of Saul, is the only one that has a sword. Now, does that sound like a very, very, very good army? Would you want to be in the army where one dude has a sword? That doesn't sound so good. So I'm just imagining that the Israelite army is a lot of guys with a rake, with a hoe, with a pickaxe, with a stick. I don't know, a Swiss army knife with a, with a toothpick. I don't know what they have. It wasn't good. It wasn't good. And as a result, Saul is, is fearful. He's, he's afraid. Now you kind of look at that and you go, well, of course he's afraid. But I got another verse to mention to you. In 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 16, this is God's word to Saul. At this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him as the ruler of my people Israel, and he will save them from the Philistines because I have seen the affliction of my people, and their cry has come to me. This is a, this is a prophecy about Saul. Saul is the Benjaminite. Or excuse me, the, the uh, yes, the Benjaminite. That's right. And... God says Saul is going to defeat the Philistines, okay? So Saul already has a promise from God that he's going to be victorious. How can you build faith in your life? It's through the promises of God. See, when, when God gives you a promise, that builds faith in our life. And maybe we should spend more time learning the promises of God because it would build more confidence within us and it would strengthen our own spiritual lives. But Saul forgets the promises of God. And when we forget the promises of God, guess what? We become fearful, right? We, we begin to lose our mind. We get desperate. We get crazy. We do things that we would not normally do under normal circumstances. And when his army ran, Saul forgot his purpose and he succumb to fear. Now, conversely, David in his life, David is a man of great faith. And in Psalm 59, verse 16, he says, but I will sing of your strength and will joyfully proclaim your faithful love in the, in the morning. You have been a stronghold for me and a refuge in my day of trouble. Now, David went through some really, really dark, hard times, probably more than Saul, and he saw God as a refuge. So listen, when you're faced with adversity, are you, do you succumb to fear? Or do you run to the refuge and the stronghold? And do you look to God to be the one that's going to lift you up 
and provide for you and take care of you and help you be victorious in the battles that are before you. Uh, David found this refuge in the Lord. It was a big refuge. And uh, he, had, he had faith. Um, I spent a lot of time in school. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, they gave me the degree program and they said, Ryan, you have to take 12 hours of a foreign language. And uh, I almost, you know, lost my mind over that. I was like, I, I have a hard enough time with English and now I'm going to take, you know, you can kind of skate through maybe one class. That's four three hour classes. And I was like, well, what do I want to take? And I thought, well, maybe I should take Spanish. But I took Spanish in high school and that didn't go so well for me. So I thought, well, I'll take Greek, okay, because I'm going to go to the seminary and the Bible is written in Greek and Hebrew. And I thought, I'll just get a leg up on learning some Greek as an undergrad. And when I get my master's degree, then I'll already know what's going on. So I signed up for the Greek class and um, there's an old phrase that says, it's all Greek to me. You know, maybe you've heard that before. That was, that, that's a great phrase. The first time I took it, I, I, I was making, I think I was, I had like an F. And so I dropped the class, you know, because if you drop the class, it doesn't hit your GPA, right? So I signed up for a second time because I still got to have 12 hours. I can't graduate if I don't have the classes, right? So I signed up for a second class and I make a D. And I was like right on the border between D and C. I'm, I'm telling you, there was some major prayer going on in my own, own heart, you know. The D and the C, I think I finished with like a high 60 something, 68, 69, something like that. But I was short. And I thought, how in the world am I going to be able to take three more classes of advanced Greek if I, if I made a D in the first class? So I signed up a third time. And guess what? I made a B. You know, I, th this, is, this is like so intelligent, I'm telling you. Um, if you keep signing up for the class, guess what? It, it does get better. The third time I had all the homework assignments done. I had copies of, of the tests. I mean, it was amazing. It's like life is really good if you just keep, you know, and I was convinced if I signed up for a fourth time, I probably would have gotten an A. You know, God gives us a test. Faith is a test. And to go to the next level in our walk with God, we have to pass the tests. Saul is facing a test. David is facing tests. And when we fail the test, what God wants us to do is to get back in the game and sign up again and to keep believing. Just because you have succumbed to fear in the past doesn't mean that you have to live a life that is always uh, surrounded and dominated by fear. We got to keep believing. We got to keep fighting that, that battle. David stepped onto the battlefield with Goliath. And, and you want to talk about faith versus fear. The reason, some people thought David was just arrogant. And that's why he fought Goliath. When you read the Bible... Uh, it was David's confidence in God that helped him step on uh, to the battle against such a, such a nasty opponent. Uh, he called him the uncircumcised Philistine. Now, those are like Bible fighting words right there, okay? <laughs> it was his faith. It was, and guess what? Your faith is the thing that's going to help you draw close to God. Let's pass the test. Let's do it. Um, secondly, waiting over rushing. Okay, now how can, I, how can I draw close to God? How can I be a person after God's own heart? Waiting versus rushing. Now look at this right here. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 7 and 8. Samuel is the prophet and he's giving David instruction about his conflict with the Philistines. So this is what he says in chapter 10. With these signs, with these signs have, when these signs have happened to you, do whatever your circumstances require because God is with you. In other words, just stay alive and hang in there, okay? In verse 8, afterwards, go ahead of me to Gilgal and I will come to you at, to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice fellowship offerings. Wait seven days until I come to you and show you what to do. So he says two things. Number one, wait seven days. Number two, I will offer the offering. 
I will bring the burnt offering. I'm the prophet, by the way, okay? Don't get this mixed up, Saul. Okay, so what does Saul do? In chapter 13, verses 8 and 9, he waited seven days for the appointed time that Samuel had set, but Samuel didn't come to Gilgal, and the troops were deserting him, so Saul said, bring me the burnt offering. Saul offers the offering. Saul waits the seven days. Now, he probably waited like to the second, you know. I, I, I suspect Saul had his stopwatch out, and he was like, okay, that's been seven days. And, and, and maybe Samuel got delayed, you know. Maybe his wife had to do her makeup or something like that. He was late, you know. But right, but right as, as Saul offers the sacrifice, Samuel shows up. So he wasn't too late. But here's what I want you to see. <laughs> Saul did half of what God said. Okay, look, he waited the seven days. Good job, Saul. But Samuel said, I'm the one that's going to offer the sacrifice. And Samuel is the, is the prophet. That's his responsibility. That Saul's the king. Kings don't offer sacrifices. That's what prophets So he did half of what God said. Now, if we're going to be people that draw close to God, we can't do half of what the Lord has called us to do. Amen? I mean, what would it be like if you told your kids, go clean your rooms, and they cleaned half of their room? What would it be like if you asked your employees to do something and they did half of everything that you said? Or what if you paid half of your bills? How would that go? You know? You're like, but I pay 50%. Come on, man. So Saul does half. He does a portion. He does a part. But, but he is rushing instead of waiting. Now, sometimes you've got to wait on the Lord. I mean, God, God's timing and my timing are rarely in accordance. Amen? I'm always on fast forward. I'm always, at least in my own mind, I'm running like this going, Lord, come on, Lord. Have you ever done that before? When we get into too much of a hurry, when we start pushing too hard, we, we make bad mistakes. How many people have gotten into the wrong marriage because they wouldn't wait? How many people took the wrong job? Because they wouldn't wait. How many people manipulated the circumstances of their life because they simply were not patient and were not waiting on God? If we're going to draw close to God, we cannot be people that are constantly pushing and pushing and pushing. We have to recognize and to realize that there are some things that in the timing of God take a little time. So we got to take a deep breath. Now, David, on the other hand, he... He, he, he waited. I mean, he, he, he was a waiter. And David waited 15 years to become king of Israel. So after Saul has his meltdown in 1 Samuel 13, um, Samuel the prophet goes and anoints under the leadership of God, David as the king of Israel, but David's a shepherd boy. And they do it in secret. If Saul had found out that another man had been anointed king while he was still king, guess what he would have done? It would have been bad for David, right? It would not have been good. So for 15 years, he knows, I'm supposed to be the king of Israel. But during that time, what is he doing? Well, he's serving in the court of Saul. How weird is that? You're like serving the guy, and you're like, I know I'm going to take his place one day because God's told me. But David's humble about it. He really is. I mean, and he learns. So, so, you know, David could see the 15 years as what a waste of time. God said this. Or he could, he could say, God told me this was coming and God was preparing me and getting me ready because it's a pretty big big deal to be the king and maybe I need a little training and maybe having an internship and maybe being a, you know, a, a, a general under the authority of Saul. Maybe that would kind of get me ready for what God wanted to do in my life. David waits. Saul is pushing. Samuel's not here. The people are leaving. See, Saul lets his circumstances dictate his actions. 
We need to let our faith dictate the choices that we make, not the circumstances. If we only look at the circumstances around us, we will always be pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. Sometimes we just got to wait for God to open the door. One time I, I, I hired a guy to come aerate my yard and I got home and he had aerated the front yard, but not the back. And he had put fertilizer, you know, and I was like, hey, I was like, hey, bro, like what's going on, man? And he, and, and he wanted to, to be paid at half. He wanted to be paid half of the, the fee. And I was like, well, you know, I, like, I understand that. And I really love my front yard, but I, I got a backyard too. You know, I, I kind of need you to do all of it. You know? <laughs> God doesn't want us to just do half. He wants us, he wants us in all, all the way. Now, when we don't wait on God, what it says is we don't trust him. When you could wait on God and go, listen, this is not my preference. This was not my plan and schedule, but I trust the God who is the creator of the heavens and the earth. Okay, Lord, I got it. You got a different plan. I'm going to wait on you, Lord. I'm a, I trust you. I, I know you're going to move. I know you're going to do something, Lord. I trust you, God. Then it allows us to wait. When, when we don't trust God, we feel like everything is in our hands. This is Saul's spirit. Saul, Saul is the picture of, uh, of a man that is doing his own thing. He, he, he is trying to force his own will. He kind of wants God there beside him, but really he's, he's, he's driving the bus, not God. And, and, and it makes for a huge, huge, huge problem. David was different. Uh, he said this in the Psalms, in you, Lord God, I put my trust. In you, Lord God, I put my trust. David was different. David waited. Saul didn't. Here's the third thing. If we're going to be people that have a heart for God, we have to choose worship over religion. Check this out. Check this out. First Samuel 13, 9. So Saul said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And then he offered the burnt offering just as he finished offering the burnt offering, Samuel arrived, so Saul went out to greet him. I mean, man, it was like right when he finished, Samuel showed up. Don't you know that Saul thought, oh, I wish I could have waited 15 more minutes. Samuel, what are you doing here, man? I thought you abandoned me. And he says, Saul, what have you done? What have you done, Saul? What's wrong with you? See, Saul has a, a religious spirit about him, which says, you know what? If we're going to go into battle, we need to be religious. We need to offer the sacrifice. We need to, we need to, to do what's religiously obligated of us. But his heart is far from God. And we can be a person that goes through religious motions and not even be a believer. These two things, that sounds kind of odd to say at church that God wants us to be worshipers, not people that are just religious. But hear what I'm saying. We can go through the motions of religiosity and our heart can be so far from God. You know, we talk a lot about spiritual disciplines here at church. We encourage people to read their Bible, to pray, to tithe. To come to church, those are all wonderful and important things and they all have a, a role in the Christian experience. But the goal in and of itself is for those things to point us to Jesus. It's to turn our heart to God, not to just check religious boxes. And after I've done ser sermon series on tithing or on uh, you know prayer or whatever, sometimes people come to me and they're like, Pastor Ryan... I've been praying and I still have a problem, you know, or I've been tithing, but I'm still in debt. What's, what's the deal? Where, where are the prompt, where are the blessings of God? You know, I checked these boxes. I, I've talked to people before that have said, you know what? I, I'm cheating on my spouse, but I am tithing. You know, where is the Lord? You know, you know? 
I have a massive substance abuse issue, but I am tithing. Where is the blessings of God? You know, God wants our heart. The Old Testament says the purpose of tithing is to show us our need for God. The reason we read the Bible is so that the Bible would speak to us about having our heart ignited for God. It's not just to read the Bible to say, I read the Bible today, or I said a prayer. You know, you can say a prayer and not know anything that it means. You could recite the Lord's Prayer. Some of us have that memorized, you know, and, and, and you could just say the Lord's Prayer, but you could just be going through the motions of religiosity. This is, this is the heart of Saul. Saul's like, we're going into battle. Samuel's not here. Let's be religious. Bring the sacrifice. I'll do it myself. God will understand. No. <laughs> Conversely, <laughs> David is all about worship. In Psalm 63, 1, God, you're my God. I eagerly seek you. I thirst for you. My body faints for you in a land that is dry, desolate, and without water. Woo. David's like, I need God, I have a relationship with God. I'm thirsty for God. Where is the Lord? Not just what's the bare minimum. What's the, the lowest common denominator that I can check this religious box and feel good about myself and go on with my day? No, he's like, man, I'm thirsty for God. I want God. Worship is about relationship. Religion leads to fear, obligation, duty, and formula. And that's not what this is about. God wants us to be people after his own heart. David loved God's word. You know, about, about 50% of the Psalms, there's 150 Psalms, about half were written by King David. And when you read those Psalms, you see this is a man who is passionate for God. Fired up, motivated, excited. And the number one topic that he discusses in the Psalms, guess what it is? It's the word of God. David loved God's word. I'm going to tell you today, if you're going to be a person after God's own heart, you have to love the word of God. They, they, they can't be separated. You got to love God's word. And when we love God's word, we'll love God's work. And we'll love the person of God and the direction of God and so many other things for us. Worship over religion. Finally, responsibility over casting blame. Now see, I think that this story could have ended up in a very, very different way if Saul would have owned his own junk. He doesn't do it. When Samuel confronts him in verse 11 through 14, let's look at his response. And Samuel asked, what have you done? And Saul answered, when I saw that the troops were deserting me and you didn't come with the appointed, in the appointed days and the Philistines were gathering at Mishmash, I thought the Philistines will now descend on me at Gilgal and I haven't sought the Lord's favor. So I forced myself to offer the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, You've been foolish. You've not kept the command of the Lord, your God, that he gave to you. And it was at this time that the Lord would have permanently established your reign over Israel. But now, now your reign will not endure. The Lord has found a man after his own heart. And the Lord has appointed him as ruler over the people because you have not done what the Lord commanded. Wow, what really, really sad. This was a test. God says, this was a test. You got an F on the test. Your kingdom would have been solidified for all these generations if you would have just done what I said, but you didn't do it, Saul. Now let's look at a couple of things here about Saul's response. It's like, I'm going to violate the will of God, but at the same time, I want God's help. Do you see it? I'm going to do the opposite of what God said, but God, you better help me in battle. I mean, that's kind of the attitude of it. And then this is my favorite part. He says uh, in verses uh, 12 or 13, he says, I forced myself. In other words, like Samuel, I'm such a good dude. 
You know, I am such a good guy. I actually had to force myself to offer the sacrifices. Do you see it? Do you see it? Um, we have a friend uh, named Susan Thomas. She's r- written a book about relationships, and she has a section about fake apologies. And I want to share some of these with you because I think they relate to Saul. Here's one fake apology. If you have relationship with some family or some friends, or maybe you work with some people, you may have used these. Some people may have used these to you, but check it out. The loophole apology. I'm sorry if I hurt you. If, all right, we wouldn't be having this conversation in other words, but if, all right, the loophole, the backhanded apology, I'm sorry you're so upset. The defensive apology, I'm sorry I wouldn't have said this if you had not said that. I'm sorry, but you really brought this on. Let me just turn the tables, you know, all the way. The insincere apology. I'm just going to say I'm sorry to get her off my back when I don't really mean it. Maybe you've gotten one of those. The unapology apology. Now, I'm sorry I got mad at you, but you know Jesus threw the tables. Aren't you glad that I didn't throw one of those tables at you? (laughs) Or the conditional apology. If she'd ever admit her part, then I'd say, I'm sorry. You know, a true apology says, I'm sorry for this, describes the wrongdoing, and then asks for forgiveness. Now, that's not what Saul did. Saul made a huge mistake. And instead of saying, you know what, Samuel, I really messed this one up. I am so sorry. I have sinned against God. Please forgive me. I don't know what I was thinking. He digs his heels in and he gives all of the excuses. Now, here's the four excuses of Saul. He's the master of the fake apology. Okay, check it out. The troops were deserting. Okay. In other words, like if all those troops wouldn't have done what they did, then I wouldn't have done. So no responsibility. Um, Samuel, you were late. See, Samuel, actually, it was your fault. You're the prophet, and you didn't do what, what, what I thought you should have done, and, and so it's, it's your fault, Samuel. The Philistines were threatening. You know what? We had some really big bad guys that were coming after us. Um, and then fourth, that he wanted God's favor. Those are the four excuses. It kind of reminds me of Exodus 32, 24, where um, Moses is on the mountain, and he's, he's having this beautiful experience with God, and he comes down, and the people are worshiping the golden calf. And he says to Aaron, he's like, hey, buddy, what happened here? And Aaron's like, you know, I have no idea. We put some gold in the fire and then poof, out of the fire popped this golden calf. And I have no idea how he got here. (laughs) Listen, if we're going to be people that have a heart for God, we have to own our stuff. The way that we have a pure heart is not that we have been perfect, the way we have a pure heart is we confess sin to God and we say, God, I've blown it. Will you forgive me? And we move back into that dynamic relationship with him. Now, on the other hand, David in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 25, David uh, has an adulterous relationship with Bathsheba and he messes up bad. I mean, this this is like a moral meltdown here. But when he's confronted by Nathan the prophet, this is what David says. David responded to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Do you see the difference? (laughs) One is blame shifting. Well, you made me. And if this wouldn't have happened, then David's like, you know, I sinned against God. David didn't say, well, you know what? Bathsheba was bathing on the roof. If Bathsheba would have not been so beautiful that I wouldn't have. And then those guards went and got her. And then I was having a bad day and I was emotionally disturbed. And no, David's like, that's on me, man. That's on me. See, when when we can own our stuff, we can take responsibility. 
we can draw close to God. <laughs> that beautiful? Let's draw close to God. Let's look at the example of David over Saul. Let's be people that are not trapped by just trying to be religious and going through the, the motions of spirituality. But let's let our heart be ignited for Jesus and for God. And let's turn our hearts to him. And when we mess up and we fall short, let's say, God, that's on me. Let's pray together for just a moment. Would you bow with me?